And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another week of the PM Show here on FreedomizerRadio.com. I am one half of your awesome hosting staff here on the show, Mandy Parsons. John Moreland is not with us tonight. He's being a slacker. I gave him the night off because, well, he's had good behavior. But in his place, I have a very good friend of mine. We'll just call her Danica the Great. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Mandy. Good to be on here. I'm so glad to have you. I'm I'm thrilled. This is very exciting. John said he might call and he might cause some problems on the air and he called it the vagina hour. I told him oh, no that's correct. Fantastic. It's the vagina two hours, actually. So we can see what kind of trouble we can stir up when you have two voluntarious anarchists on the air who both happen to be females at the same time. Oh, just going. There's just going to be amazing shenanigans going to happen. That that much I can tell you. <laughs> yes, and I haven't talked to you vocally in a while because you all had a very exciting week last week. So why don't you talk about what you did last week? Well, it seems like her call has dropped, but that is okay. And we will wait until she comes back on. But last week, like I was saying, last week in New Hampshire, they had what is called Pork Fest. That is the Por- Porcupine Freedom Festival. And it happens every year. Uh, it's the free- hosted by the Free State Project in New Hampshire. I did not get to go this year. And I was disappointed. However, however, I will be there next year. So that is that is okay. It's no problem. Um Basically, while they were gone, it's a, it's a gathering of people who want freedom and individual rights for everybody, and they just they believe in the non-aggression principle, which says that nobody should have their rights infringed upon by anybody else, and that everybody can do what they need to do for their lives, just as long as they act peacefully. As I haven't been there, I don't know the magnitude or the feeling that it exudes, but I heard that it is amazing and that I need to be there so next year for sure i missed my friends this year including danica the great who is going to be calling in here in just a few minutes uh we have a lot to talk about tonight there's a lot going on in the world i think the biggest thing to discuss or talk about is the fact that last week when i was with mr john moreland who was hosting like he usually does i told everybody that i switched my political beliefs over to anarchy and voluntarism when people talk about anarchy, they talk about how everything is chaos, which is it's not chaos. It's just saying that people should be able to run their own lives. <clears throat> so I have her on the line. I'm going to pull her in. Is that you, Danica the Great? Yes, it is me, Mandy. I'm so sorry about that. My phone hates me. Don't worry about it. Well, we should mention, though, that your phone also just took – a journey across country with you because you just moved to New Hampshire. That's right. So this is a new experience for you all the way around, and you got there just in time for what I just explained to them. You had a big week last week. You saw many people. Tell us about Porkfest. Well, um, I'll definitely get into more details about Porkfest if you want. Um, First, I'm going to cast a um, c- kind of cast a um, vision, if you will, of people saying that, you know, there were multiple um, things that happened, um, different kinds of situations happened where there were uses of uh, certain kinds of drugs, there were different kinds of guns, and yet nobody got hurt and nobody did anything that they didn't want to. It was very peaceful, it was all voluntary, and everyone had a great time. I think you're referring to the article that was written and published by the Washington Post, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was a recent uh, article that did come out about that. Uh, it was okay, I mean, from it, kind of an outsider's point of view, that may or may not be supportive of this kind of movement. Um, it was it, it, it was pretty decent. Um, the only thing that they got kind of a lo- I thought was kind of weird was that they didn't really um, talk too much about the vendors and the great things that they were doing with Bitcoin, um, the alt cryptocurrency. And plus, they were taking Pete Air, who is a you know really awesome person, as the most as the closest thing to an authoritarian figure, which is ironic because 
Pete has been running Cop Block uh, for years and years, uh, trying to focus on police brutality. So he, you know, does, obviously is not necessarily the best kind of authoritarian, but because he's had that background, I guess people would come up to him and ask for his sort of guidance if any kind of situation did seem to escalate out of control. Well, the thing that people don't understand, and I did explain that, you know, what Porkfest is, where it happens, it happens every year. Anybody who's involved in our movement knows what we are getting into. They also will, outsiders will define anarchy as utter and total chaos, which is simply not the case. There's a gross misunderstanding of the word. There's a gross misunderstanding of what we stand for. And we just want to be able to live our lives the way we need to. We don't want to make other people live our way. And we understand that there's nobody out there who's going to represent us and represent every single person equally across the board. Yes, absolutely. You know, everything is done voluntarily. Um, uh, That's actually interesting that you bring up the whole um, anarchy uh, definition. When people hear, when the majority of people hear the word anarchy, they automatically think, oh, violence, chaos, pillaging, and, you know, evil things. Like, for example, the movement, The Purge, uh, not the movement, I'm so sorry, the movie The Purge came out, I believe, last summer, talking about how in a society where one day a year, all crime is legal. Basically, people use that day to let it out of their systems and commit all sorts of heinous crimes. And the sequel that is called Purge Anarchy, and it's just like, no, that's just that's not what anarchy is, and it drives me nuts when when that's just the first thing that people think about. Well, I told John last week when we were on the air that pretty much last Wednesday was the day that it all came into. Uh, to, to clarity, I guess is the word I'm looking for, for me. I have been talking sure. to you guys for about a year now. Um, I knew what you guys stood for. I was never against it. I always probably knew that I was going to end up in that direction one day. But I think the tipping point for me was a number of events that have been happening uh, over the past several months involved with the Republican Party. And as we all know, I was involved. I'm still involved, but only because I think I could shake things up a bit, you know, and cause some problems. Sure. So that's the only reason I'm sticking with it. Plus, I made an obligation, and I have less than a year left. So I really don't feel like these, having these people question my beliefs now, or I don't feel like kicking up dirt. I just feel like doing things peacefully and getting out of there. So I'm still involved, but basically what made the decision for me was I was working for a guy's campaign who was running for the U.S. Senate to represent Georgia, and when mm-hmm. he didn't win the primaries – and didn't make the runoff that's going to happen this month, I realized the last two standing people were the same old status quo that people have been voting on for the last several years, and there's no change. They claim to want change. They don't really want change. And they're not interested in the viewpoints. They're not interested in what the people stand for. They simply just want a Republican to beat the Democrat. That's it. And that you know you bring up you bring up an absolutely good point um, where people just seem to be divided either left or right uh, when that comes down to when when it comes to my personal belief in that it's just that it uh, demo, uh, Democrats the liberals the left uh, drive me nuts because they want to try and they they want to try I mean every side tries to force its beliefs and its regards on everyone else like the conservatives are trying to look at everything from a moral standpoint that, you know, oh, everything is, needs to be done for religious purposes, and Democrats are like, oh, everything needs to be done to try and help those that are impoverished, the lazy, the ones that don't want to work onto everybody else. And it's just ne- neither side uh, ne- neither side wins, to speak. So, you know, it's, it's frustrating equally from either a Republican point of view or from a uh, uh, Democratic point of view. Absolutely. And I'm going to jump back to something you were talking about at Porkfest. It seems that any outside source that doesn't understand the whole movement, doesn't understand what's happening, they're going to come in and they're going to focus on the scariest things and they're going to make it seem like it's out of control. Because how dare this massive group of people come together and coerce um, and be together and they're cohesive peacefully. Oh, we can't have that. You know, we can't be peaceful in a big group of people. And you were talking about the open carry. Um, that reminded me that recently the state of Georgia passed the most extensive open carry law in the United States, potentially setting the precedent for open carry laws across the United States. Um, it went into effect today. 
that cops don't have the right to ask anybody to show their ID, that to be able to uh, openly carry. And, of course, people are only focusing on those who are going to go out and start shooting people and people who have mental disabilities. Well, those people need to be reminded that if you even have a history of mental illness, you're not allowed to carry a gun. You can't get a gun. So that's that's a null and void argument. But this this is massive. I mean, campuses, school campuses now are allowed to have open carry. You can go into bars. You can go into churches if they allow you to open carry. And people fail to remember that the people who are open carrying, they usually have years of extensive practice and training to be able to carry. They have to take some, some courses. So it's not like we're just letting random people walk around with these guns. And it really kind of is insulting to think that just because these people have guns and they're allowed to, to carry them, it's insulting to think they think they're idiots with the weapons just because they have them. And just because uh, open carry is allowed, everyone well, – I guess I shouldn't say everyone because that seems like an overall basis, but a lot of people seem to think that, oh, they'll just carry a gun for whatever reason that they feel like it, and, oh, we're just going to start shooting up things. And, and it's just thinking, no. I mean, look at cops, for example. Cops carry guns around all the time. Does anyone think that they're just going to randomly bust out the guns and start shooting people? No, absolutely not. Um, people will say, oh, I don't want my kid around that guy because he's carrying a gun, even though that person is perfectly legal and trained to be carrying them. It's like, okay, well, you wouldn't feel so bad if your kid were walking around near a cop, would you? And cops carry guns, and cops you know, in the news have been shooting dogs and shooting people, often without warning and often just because they feel like it. So that kind of argument absolutely holds no ground whatsoever. It doesn't, and the only difference between cops and any other citizen is the fact that the cops have a shiny badge. I mean, that's it, and it's like you said, police brutality is on the rise, and if you look even on social media, Facebook, you constantly see article after article after article of pets getting killed, of people getting hurt, of people dying because they were tased, they were manhandled, they, they were brutality. Um, people forget that, yes, people who shoot guns can kill other people, but the fact that the people who know how to use them are carrying them, it could mean the difference between life and death for some. Uh, I know that last weekend between Friday and Sunday, 27 people were killed in Chicago alone. And why do I bring up Chicago? Well, because they are not – civilians are not allowed to own guns in Chicago. So the only people mm-hmm. wandering around with guns are the people who got them illegally to begin with. And they're going to keep on committing crimes. And the only difference is the people who don't have guns anymore are not going to be able to protect themselves from these criminals. It's funny that you bring up the more uh, police, police brutality on the rise. Um, I, um, I'm, not sh- I'm not quite sure if I think it's necessarily on the rise. I mean, it could definitely will be. I would certainly have to see some statistics about that. But basically, I think what's more, pre- uh, what's more prevalent about this is that there's more um, – people are becoming more aware of it. Like, there's, like you said, social media um, has people instantly loading videos from their phones straight onto YouTube, onto Twitter, onto other social media platforms. So I think um, quite possibly the main difference is that we have more, uh, we have more abilities now to – to document police brutality and show it. So maybe it may, you know, again, I would, you know, I'm not necessarily saying what you're saying is untrue. I'm just saying that I think our uh, our ability to capture such brutality um, allows us to become aware that, wow, this is really happening and the police aren't as, you know, protective and looking out for us as we were, you know, we were brainwashed to think that way. I think you're right. You brought up a very good point right there. You certainly brought up the point. It could be just because it's getting more coverage now. And I would much rather have a family member that I trust who has taken the training and has the ability to shoot protect me than to have to call law enforcement. I really would, and that's the truth about it, just because of all the stuff we're seeing. People these days who have an absolutely clean record can walk around with a clean record and still can be made into a criminal and have done nothing wrong. That's because your family member has a um, has 
moral obligation, I guess, or just they're um, they're incented to protect you because they care about you and they want to protect you because you're their family. Police have no incentive to necessarily protect you because they're there to drive revenue up. They're there to collect uh, tax money. They're there to um, enforce bad laws and to keep those that question those silent. So the police have no obligation to necessarily look out for your safety. They're there simply for uh, for money purposes. Absolutely. And something else that you made mention of earlier, you were talking about, I think, how um, the government is making decisions for people or uh, something of the like. I forget exactly what the quote was, but that made me, reminded me of the Hobby Lobby issue. We might as well mention the Hobby Lobby issue. I know you feel very passionately Certainly. about it, I, and I did want to talk about it. So talk, tell us about what you've been seeing as far as uh, issues concerning the Hobby Lobby situation. Okay. Well, um, when the, so everyone knows that with the ruling of Obamacare that um, businesses that may have not been carrying insurance or just not very much insurance were now all forced to carry insurance. Everyone was required to have some sort of health insurance, and businesses, employers were required to provide it to some degree. Uh, now, Hobby Lobby, uh, much like Chick-fil-A, um, is founded with religious principles. They have a very religious background, and they um, they did not feel that uh, carrying uh, goodness health insurance was necessarily correct in their religious beliefs because they did not want to carry certain kinds of birth control that could be linked to abortions. Uh, obviously, they you know they felt that kill, you know the killing of babies, the abortions were against their religious beliefs. So they took the case to Supreme Court, and they said, we don't feel that it is right for us as a, re- as a religious business um, to, care, to, you know, to support this, this kind of birth control that would trigger these abortions. And after several months, I believe it's been about a year, maybe more than a year, uh, they finally, th- the Supreme Court ruled in their favor that it, it's, not, uh, it's not right for them to be forced to carry that kind of thing according to their religious beliefs. Now, a lot of uh, a lot of people. George Takai, for example, um, is decl- is asking his fans to boycott Hobby Lobby because he feels that this is a step backwards for the rights of women. But if you look at some of the uh, paperwork that Hobby Lobby has dis- has displayed, uh, Hobby Lobby uh, their insurance supports 16 out of 20 birth control methods. The four that it does not support have been known to link some sort of medicine. Uh, to it that you know aids in um, aids in abortion. So they're carrying birth control, but it's the kind that prevents um, pregnancy from actually happening, not potentially aborting the baby when it's already been formed. So me as you know a voluntary as anarchist, um, I mean I am not I'm certainly not religion religious at all. I was raised in a religious family, but I'm not religious whatsoever. Um, to me, that's just thinking. If you don't want to work for Hobby Lobby, then then you certainly don't have to. You're not required to work for it and receive that kind of birth control. They are allowed to practice their religious rights as an organization to not support that certain kinds of birth control that could lead to that. That's perfectly within their right. And if women don't like it, they they certainly do not have to work for them. And if they do, like I said, there's 16 other kinds of birth control that go on the insurance plans that they can take just as easily. And most of them fall very inexpensively. I believe the birth control um, the birth control rates are anywhere between 9 and $20. So there's plenty of different options for women. I don't think this is a step backwards whatsoever. I was a bit bamboozled myself when they started saying that, oh, this is a step back for women. No, if you decide to apply at Hobby Lobby and you get a job at Hobby Lobby, you are voluntary – uh, you are voluntarily entering into a contract with them to work for their company. Period. Absolutely. You know what the co- you know what the company is about. You know what the company stands for. So if you don't like that, why would you go in and say, "Well, I want to work for you, but I'm gonna I'm gonna yell at you about your policy." Plus, as a Christian organization, they're being pretty liberal as it is for a Christian organization because many Christian groups don't think that a woman should take birth control at all. That sex is for procreation, and that if you're taking something to prevent that, then you are going against your religious beliefs as well. Yeah, so that's a very good point because you know, they understand that they're not they're not in my opinion they're not forcing their religious beliefs on anyone. And, you know, they make it pretty uh, pretty apparent that they are a religious organization, and you are correct. They are being very liberal and very um, what's the word? 
not not easy going, but they're being very liberal and they're you know and they're helping out with birth control by saying, hey, here are the ones that we do support. Here's the ones that we don't. And you know they're being fully open and you know and disclosing about that. So if they're you know if you're a woman and you're volunteering and, and you apply and you get a job there, I mean really you don't really have anywhere to complain. Well, we also saw the backlash with Chick Fil A, another Christian organization, and things people uh, might not understand. I live in the Southern Baptist Bible Belt. Religion is a huge deal down here. I don't think it is mm-hmm. so much up where you are now. I know you came from Idaho. I don't know anything about Idaho. <laughs> so, oh, Idaho is pretty it's pretty red and religious too. I mean, it's just it's right north of Utah where we all know um where the LDS church is founded. So there's a huge LDS and Catholic region there, but you know, by all means do go ahead. I I was just saying I I definitely understand where you're coming from a re- very religious state. Yeah, I'm glad that you reminded me of that. My brother lives in Utah. He's about to move. Actually, I think they moved to Idaho. So I'll be going actually in three weeks. I'll let you know how that goes. It'll be probably a shell I'm very sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not even in a major city. They live, from what I understand, out in the middle of nowhere. So we'll see what happens. But um, down here in the Southern Baptist Bible Belt, uh, I just pretty much summed it up. It is the Baptist Bible Belt. Everything leads back to the Bible down here in the South. So the fact that we have organizations like Hobby Lobby, Chick-fil-A, they're closed on Sundays so that their employees can spend time with their families, a.k.a. they can go to church on Sundays. That's what they're telling them. Because Sunday is, is a revered day for the churchgoers. You know, according to their biblical beliefs, they don't go to church, or they go to church and, and then they don't work after that. The rest of the day is to be spent with the family. They close about 8 o'clock during the week, Hobby Lobby does, um, Chick-fil-A had backlash when they said, you know, we don't agree with homosexuality. They didn't say homosexuals can't come to Chick-fil-A. They didn't say homosexuals can't work at Chick-fil-A. They simply said that as a company, because of our beliefs, we don't agree with homosexuality. Um, I don't think personally that there's an issue with homosexuality. If those people want to be that way, they are that way, let them be that way. How is it affecting me? It's not. But, again, anybody who works at a place like Chick-fil-A or Hobby Lobby, they understand what the company is ahead of time. They don't hide their beliefs. And if you apply to work there and get hired on, you are voluntarily signing a contract to work with these people. You're absolutely correct about that. Again, you're you're voluntarily choosing to associate and work for this person. No one's forcing you to get a job at Chick-fil-A. No one is forcing you to get a job at Hobby Lobby. I'm not... I don't know if I'd want to work at either place just because I don't want to work at either place. <laughs> but sure, you know, it absolutely. has nothing to do with, with the birth control. But it's like you said, George Takai, that that makes me upset because he's got a fantastic sense of humor. Anybody who is uh, signed up with his Facebook page or follows him, he always posts the most hilarious stuff. But that is disappointing to me, and I'm glad that there are men out there who want to fight for the rights of women. But I think that in this case, some of the men are overstepping their boundaries. Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct about that, George Takai. You know, he's, he's absolutely hilarious. I, you know, I've been a fan of his. I've loved Star Trek, and I appreciate all the uh, amazing work he's done for not just homosexuals, but for you know, gay, you know, gays, lesbians, and human rights in general. Like he's definitely made some huge bounds. Um, very funny guy, a uh, very nice guy, but you know I do agree that he, you know, might be a lot of people are probably looking at this the wrong way and not looking at it as just, you know, hey, this is a perfect example of you know the right, you know, right of speech and the right of voluntarism. I'm going to switch gears here, and I want to go back to the gun situation for a minute we were talking about. Let me tell you what happens on the very first day that Georgians are allowed to open carry. So according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is Atlanta's major newspaper, um, in Valdosta, Georgia, which is a little college town on the border, basically, of Georgia and Florida, uh, apparently there were two men open carrying, and one man carrying a holstered firearm entered a store to make a purchase. And another customer, who also had a holstered firearm, approached him and demanded to see his identification and firearms license. And that's when the police got involved. This is what they wrote in the report. Um, It said the customer making demands for ID pulled his firearm from its holster but never pointed it at the other customer who said he was not obligated to show any permits or identification. And then he said he demanded the man's ID again. 
He was not deterred by the drawn gun, and the man paid for his items and left the store and called the the police. Uh-huh. Okay, so these are the kinds of people that this this law is allowing to walk around with guns, and people are getting scared. I don't know what caused this man to sit here and ask the other guy for his ID. I don't even know what gave him the idea he had the permission to do that. But, I mean, from this story, I mean, what do you think about this? I think it is my conclusion that the man who asked for the ID was was not the one, was it? Yeah, he pulled his firearm from its holster, but he never pointed it at the other customer. So I'm I'm very – what do you think about this? I mean, here's this new law. It's people like this. What do you think? I think that, you know – you said that the, you said that there's law that requires them to not have to show ID, correct? Yeah, that's a apparently. Um, I don't know if it's the law that says that they don't have to show it, but I know that certainly if the man is telling the other man, I don't have to show my identification to you, you know. So I'm unclear on that one fact, but it says the customer making demands for the ID pulled his firearm from the holster but never pointed it at the other customer who said he was not obligated to show any permits or identification. So the man who pulled the gun from the holster was the man asking the other guy for the ID. So they called the cops and they arrested the man who was asking for the ID on a charge of disorderly conduct because he pulled the weapon out inside the store. Well, from what it sounds like that he's pulling the gun trying to cause some sort of stir in an attempt to try and get a reaction. You know, he's obviously making a threat by if the if the guy that's that's refusing to show his ID um doesn't want to show his ID and the other guy pulls a gun. I mean, don't you think that pulling a gun couldn't you know, is kind of an excuse to try and stir some sort of reaction to say, "Hey, if you don't show me your ID, I'm pulling my gun on you." He may not have pointed it, but why else was he pulling out the gun? Was he trying to inspect it or anything? No, he was it sounds to me that he was just trying to use it to get some sort of reaction for it. Oh, it says later in the article, by the way, it says, it seems as if the fellow forgot that under Georgia's new gun law, no one can demand to see another's carry permit without cause, not even the police. So, yeah, the police could not have come in without a cause and asked to see the man's ID. Now, let me tell you, while this was the most liberal gun law that was passed across the nation in any state, the man who had it passed, his name is Nathan Deal. He's the current governor of Georgia, and I really believe that the only reason he passed this law is because – he was trying to garner votes. He is up for re-election, but he is a contradictory of terms anyway because he ran mm-hmm. as a Democrat several years ago. He was in the Democratic Party. Everybody hated him because he was a Democrat. He wasn't anything in Georgia that I know of. I don't know what he did, but he was very corrupt. He has corruption charges all over the place. And he switched parties, so now he is the Republican golden boy, and they love him. Oh, boy. And that's the, that's the exact kind of example that I was talking about that – when they switch parties, it doesn't matter what they stand for, what they used to stand for, just as long as he has that R and can be the Democrat, that's all that matters. Uh, well, you know, the R usually means that there's some sort of religious backing to him, so that that really does not surprise me at all. I'm not trying to be stereotypical, just, you know, no, you know, but, you know, based on being raised in a very religious family, in a very Republican family, you know, I call it like I see it. Absolutely. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick break, and we will be back very shortly. All right, let me pull great. Up the studio here. Okay, let me pull up the studio. Yeah, we will be back in just a moment. Did you know most Americans know nothing or very little about the legal system? I am the Rose, Rose Colombo, longtime legal activist, legal coach, legal advocate, and the author of Fight Back Legal Abuse, Irwin Award winner, and also my latest political satire, Obamacare Dinosaurs, Rednecks, and Radicals, a political satire exposing the evil agendas of Obamacare and redistribution of wealth that leaves you with a thought-provoking ending. Will mankind survive, or will the U.S. natural-born citizens become ex? It's available at Amazon.com. You can also visit my website at www.fightbacklegalabuse.com for more information. So order your copy today and empower yourself with knowledge before injustices come knocking on your back door 
unexpectedly. Hi, I have a question for you. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Do you want a company that provides good quality ingredients and does not use artificial sweeteners? Look no further. Genesis Pure has a complete lineup of health and wellness, sports performance, and superfruit juices like noni and mangosteen that are pure, wild harvested with no binders and fillers. The philosophy is simple. Cleanse the body of toxins, balance the body's pH and hormones, and build the body nutritionally. Every race has a starting line, and yours is cleanse, balance, build. Sign up for at least a 25% discount and include auto ship of at least one product to start building up 20% back in points for free products. It's a win-win. Help fund our operation while you fund your body nutritionally. Start your journey at genesispure.com backslash freedomizer health. Again, that is genesispure.com backslash freedomizer health. Hello everyone, Proof is here. I want to let you know about our latest promotion on our freedomizerradio.com website. Our chat client, Bark, B-A-R-C dot com, is hosting a micro-Bitcoin giveaway while supplies last. All you have to do is go to freedomizerradio.com, join our chat room, create a screen name, and type to your friends. And some micro-Bitcoins will fall from the sky. Not only that, the more people that are typing, there will be some random lotteries as well. So just for typing to your friends, you can earn some micro-Bitcoins. So who knows how long this will last, but join us now, freedomizerradio.com. There are a lot of problems with Common Core. I don't even have time to go into most of them. But a step in the right direction would be to give local communities, teachers, parents, control over their schools so they can design curriculums and standards to best meet the needs of their students and get the federal government out of education. Thank you for tuning in to Freedomizer Radio, where we have a 24-7 chat room where you can come and share what's going on in the world with people of like mind. Anything and everything against the New World Order. Dial 347-324-3704 to catch our live show. Beginning at 9 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, Monday through Friday till midnight, and 9 to 9 on Saturday and Sunday. Take us to the beach. Take us to the park. Take us on a walk with the dog. Only on Freedomizer Radio. And we are back. I am your host, Mandy Parsons. I have Danica the Great with me. Thanks for joining me on short notice. I appreciate you joining me on short notice tonight. You are awesome. And I wanted to mention something. Oh, yes, that's what I wanted to mention. That's right. I do want to remind everybody that we do have a chat room. If you go to freedomizerradio.com, there is a little tab off to the side that says chat room. Please click on that and go create a name and come chat with us in the chat room. Also, feel free to give us a call at 347 324-3704 324-3704 to share your thoughts, comments, share anything that's on your mind if you want, and if you want feedback, we'll give it to you. Um, we we do have a caller. We'll take this caller in just a second, um, but I do want to remind everybody, too, that if you missed tonight's show or you just want to listen to a rebroadcast, join us on the Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube. You can catch the PM show from 4 to 6. That's at uh, Eastern Time. And you can hear, I don't recommend calling or jumping in the chat room at that time because that's for the night before. But if you want to hear us, we are on the Voluntary Virtues Network. And also feel free to listen to any other shows on Freedomizer or even sign up for the Voluntary Virtues Network. You will enjoy what you hear. I'm sure you will. So we are back. Now, Danica, I wanted to talk about, I think our country has hit an all-new low. Absolutely. I think I think our country has hit an all-new level. Let me explain why. Have you seen the pictures circulating of that felon who's supposedly like this really hot guy that all the women are drooling over? Oh, my God. Have I ever. I'm looking at just being like, uh... You know, he might be decent looking. He might be kind of okay looking. But I'm sorry. Once a guy is arrested for uh, as a felon, 
I think all his good looks go straight out the window. You know what? Okay, um, but you know, that uh, that brings you know that that brings up a good thing. Um, so, uh, have you ever seen the Netflix show Orange Is the New Black? I am very well aware of it. I have not seen it yet. No. Okay. All right. Well, I'm not gonna um, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna reveal any plot holes or anything like that. But you know, when you when you say that when someone is instantly arrested as a felon, and you know, thrown into prison or any of those convictions, and you say that good looks automatically go out go out the window. I mean, I, I, I would, well, and I just think I wouldn't necessarily. I mean, you are correct. He, he's he's pretty decent looking. I mean, he's certainly you know definitely not ugly. He, he is certainly attractive in certain um, in certain aspects. But you know, watching the show has kind of made me realize. You know what? Just because someone has been thrown into prison and convicted of a felon, it just it doesn't necessarily make them a bad person, nor does it make them an ugly person either. I mean, these people um, were trying to accomplish these crimes or whatever. You know, not all of them victim and, victimless, um, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily make them a bad person. You know, they may have made a mistake, they may have messed up and got thrown into prison, but that doesn't necessarily make them a bad person. So, I mean, I, I have to agree with you that, it, you know, the swarms of women, you know, drooling over this guy is kind of a little nauseating. You can go, okay. Simmer down, women. But I mean, I, you know, I, I was just trying to say that, you know, just because he's a felon, just because he's been convicted of something, does not necessarily make him a bad person. But uh, that I, that's my soapbox there. So please continue. <laughs> oh, and he's he's you know, you're right. It might not make him a bad person. He's actually uh, now a felon because of gang related activity. But the thing that brings yeah. America to an all new low is that because his mugshot went viral, he was offered a $30,000 L.A. modeling contract. You know, I, I saw that you showed me that, and I was thinking, that, that, are you sure that's not an Onion article? <laughs> no, I'm sure it's not, because let me tell you, the one I'm reading actually is from um, the Daily Mail from the U.K., and I really oh. like I really like going to this publication because, our media in the United States is so censored that to, in order to find news that you can't find in your own country about your own country, you have to reach out to media outlets from other countries. Like Russia Today, they say a lot of stuff about the United States. Uh, the Daily Mail says a lot of stuff about the United States. There could be things happening in your own hometown that you wouldn't know about that you can read in these publications. That's how sad it mm-hmm. is. So no – this is not an Onion article. This is from the Daily Mail. This man um, is currently being held on $900,000 bail, accused of 11 felony crimes. But when he comes out of jail, if he comes out, he's got a $30,000 modeling contract waiting for him. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. You know, I, you know, I lost faith in all of my – in everything immediately related when I found out that Honey Boo Boo got her own show. Honey Boo Boo. You know I live two hours from Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, I live two hours from Honey Boo Boo. I have never seen her in person. I have never tried to see her in person. Uh, I know friends of mine have gone out to random restaurants. They have tried to um, just go out and do their thing in public. They might run into the family. The family will tell them we don't sign autographs. Um, apparently, right in my city, where I live, there's a Cracker Barrel. Are you familiar with Cracker Barrel? Oh, yes, I love Cracker Barrel. Okay, good. Um, that's a smart girl who loves Cracker Barrel. And apparently uh-huh. she loves it, too, because she was there playing checkers, and she had bodyguard all around her, and they wouldn't allow autographs. So basically, if someone wanted an autograph, the bodyguard would take the piece of paper and have her sign it, and then he'd pass it back over to the person. But they will not let anybody near this family. And I'm I'm just thinking to myself, really? How in the world did these people become stars to begin with? I know. Just one, you know, toddlers and tears, just one person acting out, acting like a kid, is just kind of like, oh, my God, we can totally get – Thousands and thousands of money from this girl, and look at look at the Kardashians for crying out loud. Like I know Kim kind of skyrocketed to fandom because of that sex tape, and because her father uh, represented OJ. But I mean, just you know, when you look at it, it's just like these people are just famous because we just give them so much unreasonable attention. But you know, anyway, not trying to derive from what you're getting at, but that was just a, you know along the same lines of Honey Boo Boo, and just that uh, it's just it's crazy just how much attention we give these people. It's just like, why? 
Oh, absolutely. And the thing that killed me about this felon getting a modeling contract, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a public school teacher, much to the chagrin of the people in our movement who ask me all the time, how can you do that when you know what kind of schools that we have in the United States? Um, but my students will see things like this, and they'll think, man, I can go to jail and I can come out and be a celebrity. It's the same thing with rap stars that go to jail. It's the same thing for anybody who goes to jail and comes out as celebrity. You know, there have been plenty mm-hmm. of rap stars who have gotten in trouble. They come out. My kids want to be rappers, and heck, it doesn't matter what they do in their life, and it doesn't matter if they get an education because they can come out of jail and they can be rap stars. So, like I said, all new low. Congratulations, America, if things weren't bad enough. You just gave a modeling contract to a felon. Awesome. Yeah, that that just makes me chuckle and shake my head. Like, I, I saw that article, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But no, no, that's a, it's a legitimate article. That's pretty crazy. I agree. Now, I'm going to pull our caller on the air that Larry is going to join us. Uh, hold on a second here. Okay, yeah. All right, I'm going to pull Larry on. Greetings, Larry. How hello, are Larry. you? Oh, I'm doing say, okay. Say hello is to it, my friend, uh, Danica. Hello, you're to Amanda's friend. What was your name? Hi, Larry. Uh, my name's Danica. Danica. Danica, okay. Uh, Mandy. Just because somebody's a felon doesn't make them a bad person, okay? With the way it has nothing to do is, with being a bad person. Well, I know, but you, you should hear yourself. Felon. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's like, who was it? Uh, Amash D'Souza, I think, is getting persecuted by the government. And then you also have James Traffican, who is in Congress. And because he went against Congress and was for We the People, they railroaded him bad, sent him to prison. I'm not judging his character. I'm not judging his character. I don't know him. But the fact is, well, he, he, but he is a felon. He is, and the fact of the matter is, so no, what's worse is he's a gangbang. That's the bad part. Not a felon. He's a gangbang. The fact of the matter is that the man is not setting an example in society of what I would like my children, my my students to become, and we're teaching them that you can do bad things. And you can get rewarded for it. Yeah. Now, if my child wanted to be like James Traffican and in the face of being persecuted, still did the right thing, now that's a good-spirited, well-brought-up, well-raised individual because he did cower. James Traffican wound up, you know, having Congress just totally railroaded. But anyway, that's what happens when you try to do the right thing and be a statesman, not a politician. Uh, On to other things. You were talking about open carry. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did they publish that guy's name that uh, was arrested? Yes, they did. Okay. I wonder what happened to him. His name is Ronald Uh, something or the other. Yeah. I'm for open carry, by the way. And of course you are. You support the Constitution. Yes, thank you. My permit is the Constitution. That's the only piece of paper I need. But do you uh, have you ever heard of a saying, an armed society is a polite society? No, but I get the gist of what you're saying. Yes, you know, I'll, I'll give you three guesses on who could have possibly said it. Uh, let me see. Obama, Bill nope. Clinton, nope. and Jimmy Carter. Nope. Struck out. Yeah, I know I did. Smart Alex. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> okay. Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Maybe I should interview him yeah. sometime. Oh, yeah, wait, you can't. He's a... dead. Darn. <laughs> that would be a good interview. It would, except I hope that we understand his his dialect. I would. I could translate for you if you didn't understand him. I understand hey, Middle hey. English, too. Middle English is pretty tough. That I don't know. I better back up. Middle English, I have to stop and think for a minute. Just reading the Tyndale and Geneva Bible really threw me for a loop at the original writing. 
But anyway, uh, yeah, I I have to say I'm for an armed society. Uh, I've seen it where it works. Is that the only instance where they had a a bad goings on, so to speak, when people were open carry in public kind of thing? Um, so on far, that? yes. So far, yes. Okay. And for the record, for the record. Case. Now, for the record, I, I'm okay with the open carry policy. My relatives carry responsibly. I am for this. I mean, if I am on a but sidewalk... What do you mean, carry responsibly? They, have, they know carry. how to use their weapons responsibly. Okay. They know how to use their firearms responsibly. They're not going to just pull it out and be careless with it. And most right. people, especially, especially in the South, they are, there are a lot of gun carriers in the South. So people yeah. like to go hunting. That's a that's a very popular pastime down here. So yeah. down here, it, it's important. It's a way of life for us. A lot of gun carriers in Texas. Too. A lot of people just don't see it because they can see them. Uh, yeah, so there's lo- there's lots carry. of uh, there's lots of carriers here in uh, New Hampshire. And what's interesting in some of the businesses that I've seen while being here in New Hampshire is that. Uh, businesses will post a sign saying that we, you know, politely request that people do not uh, carry guns inside the businesses. So, it, you know, it's very interesting to see that they, while they are in support of people having guns and owning them, they would they ask them to not carry um, guns into their place of business, which I think is certainly within the rights of the business to ask that. Yeah, it's their right. I mean, it's their business. It's private. And Absolutely. So it's- you know, if they don't want me going in there with a weapon, I can, uh, being that it's a free country, so to speak, I don't have to go to their business. You I are absolutely correct in that. And I can I take my late, money elsewhere. The latest business to jump on the we don't want the guns in the store bandwagon is actually Target. Target said that open carrying inside their stores goes against the family-friendly atmosphere that they're trying to promote. Whatever, yeah. Meanwhile, they sell GMO garbage, too, and all sorts of weirdness. Then Walmart's <laughs> the same way. Walmart doesn't want you to carry inside their stores, either. Yeah, same with uh, Chipotle, but that was probably due to, uh, you know, those assholes that were just going and saying, oh, look at us, we've got guns, herp a derp, we're going to show everything here. It's like, no, guys, that's not how you do it. <laughs> no. Well, in the wintertime, nobody even knows whether or not I have a firearm or not. Now, in the summertime, it's kind of hard to hide a forty four Magnum. That thing has a bulge to it where I just don't even bother carrying it. But in the wintertime, you know, because I carry a, it's not really a shoulder holster. Uh, well, never mind. I won't say it. But anyway, yeah, in the summertime, I just don't bother carrying it. I just, you know, because in Texas, we don't have the open carry yet. We're working on that. But the only thing I have is that stupid hog leg. I need to get something smaller. Oh well. That's because, Mandy, that's because you don't want you don't want your bulge to be seen, Larry. Is that correct? Well, I like my bullets to count. Theory of one shot takes care of the job. You know, I don't want oh, to have yeah. to shoot something. I don't like the thought of shooting something three or four times just to get the job done. So, but you know, some people might call that overkill, but. You know, oh well. Anyway, so uh, what do you do up in New Hampshire, young lady? Well, I moved up here for the Free State Project about um, about a month ago, and I already feel much much better and happier living here, um, living living in a place where I mean. New Hampshire definitely has its share of people that, you know, may not be so liberty minded, but everything in New Hampshire itself is very much, hey, you know what, you are an individual and you look out for yourself and no one really is going to impede in that. Like everyone has a sense of personal responsibility. For example, uh, the place where I'm living at, uh, the crosswalks um, don't always have um, crosswalk signals, like they don't have a walk and don't walk sign. So an individual person, while, yes, they are a pedestrian and naturally have the right of way, um, they're they're responsible for trying to make sure that the driver sees them when they're attempting to cross so that there's no accident. So I get That could be confusing for somebody in California because somebody from California might not know what to do. Where's the button? I have to have a button to push. I know. (laughs) 
I'm a, I'm I'm from Idaho actually, so moved almost about three thousand miles oh. to be here. Wow, that's a far move. Yes, it was very far and very long. <laughs> but Idaho is pretty much into that freedom kind of thing too. Why did you move? Um, you know, there were a lot of reasons. Number one, I had li- I've lived in Idaho uh, the majority of my life, and I wanted to change. Um, secondly, Idaho is a right to work state, which you know I agree to some. Yeah, I agree to it to some extent, but I didn't like the fact that anyone can be terminated job for whatever reason. I thought that was just kind of a you know a BS rule, so to speak. I also did not like the amount of religiousness that was in the state. Uh, I felt yeah, you know, a lot of Mormons. Everyone... I don't get along with the Mormon religion thing. But, yeah, hey, and on the that politics. Right to work are... state, that's a, let me let me clue you in on something. I don't, I'm not really big on unions, but in Texas we have the right to work too. Okay. Yep. But that, I, I don't know about Idaho, but I know in Texas that the double-edged sword. You can fire me. You have that right. Okay. But it better be for a good reason, because I can come back to you if it was a wrongful termination. Absolutely, yeah, and Idaho doesn't really have a lot of that discrimination protection, so to speak, and uh, another thing that was driving me crazy about the state is that everyone is either is either like extremely left or extremely right. There's hardly anything in between, so you have the majority of the population that seems to be very liberal and wanting these you know, new taxes and these new ideas implemented, but you've got all these government heads, heads of state that are signing these bills denying, um, you know, funding to schools and trying to prevent gay marriage from happening. And it's just like, okay, why are you banning something that has no effect on you, can actually be a good thing, and you're denying these kids this opportunity to get better textbooks and better technology to further their education. Like Idaho ranks nearly um, nearly dead last as far as um, well, school improvement goes. what is goes. the education you're talking about? You're not talking about this common core stuff, are you? Because that's... Getting new isn't necessarily good if it's worse than what you have. Well, what I'm saying is that the majority of the public schools here, such as elementary and high school, I mean, I, I was homeschooled, so I don't nec- you know, and I also don't necessarily agree with public schooling anyway because of just not, not only are they not learning anything, but the government just has no right to be involved in public schooling. But you have this governor that's signing this bill banning gay marriage when, you know, that million dollars can be going somewhere else, such you know, such a place like schools where the funding can be better, they can get better access how did, to technology. How did, how did banning gay marriage cost a million dollars? He's signing this, he signed this bill into effect that is going to, Cost about a billion, not a billion dollars. Sorry, about a million dollars to try and prevent gay marriage from being legal in Idaho. I don't see how it would cost money to say no. You can't do it. What's that? I'm sorry. I lost signal. Yeah, I lost signal. Oh, hello. Hello. I'm still here. here. Okay. Well, it sounds like he's having signal problems, but it is time for us to take a, another break. So we will be back right after these messages. All right. Thank you for tuning in to Freedomizer Radio, where we have a 24-7 chat room where you can come and share what's going on in the world with people of like mind. Anything and everything against the new world order. Dial 347-324-3704 to catch our live shows. Beginning at 9 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, Monday through Friday till midnight, and 9 to 9 on Saturday and Sunday. Take us to the beach. Take us to the park. Take us on a walk with the dog. Only on Freedomizer Radio. Come listen to Ancient of Days, where we talk about the lies, misrepresentations, and holes in the history we learned in school. Mondays, 3 p.m. Pacific Time, only on Freedomizer. Thank you. Hi, this is the Wolfman. And this is... A.D. Venture. 
Join us as we host the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Every Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2 p.m. Pacific. You'll learn about primitive skills, survival techniques, equipment and gear. We'll also discuss useful tips and tricks, product reviews, and even have a few special guest appearances. Join me, the Wolfman, and me, A.D. Venture, for the Barefoot Bushcraft Radio Show. Right here on Freedomizer Radio, every Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Thank you for listening to Freedomizer Radio. This is Jen Coffey, your host of the Knives, Lipstick, and Liberty Show. Join the conversation every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. This is Jen Coffey, thanking you for listening to FreedomizerRadio.com. Are you dedicated to ending the new world order? Well, it's time to make way for spontaneous order. Hi, I'm Eric Bell, host of Freedomizer Radio's new hit show, For Whom the Bell Tolls, where you will hear current events from a volunteer's perspective, philosophical libertarianism, and a roadmap to a free and stateless society. Tune in every Tuesday at 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific and 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And we're back. Welcome to our number two of the PM show. I am one of the regular hosts, Miss Mandy Parsons. I have Danica the Great on the line with me tonight, and she is doing a great job. Keep it up, Danica. Oh, thanks, thanks, Mandy. This is uh, only my third time I've been on radio, so I'm still learning the basics. Try not to be awkward. Try not to have uncontrolled silence, and trying to get the hang of it. So it's uh it's it's been just but it's been lots of fun. Well, I'm sure. Well, and I can't say I'm sure, but the other shows. At least one of them I know you've been on. It's a completely different format from what I have you on tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's pre, it, it, you know, I don't want. You know, I love being on the show, um, but you know, it's just it's very comedic. It's very silly. Um, you know, lots of very not safe for work kind of discussions. But we have a lot of fun, and we do a lot of drinking, and we discuss different kinds of beers among other inappropriate things. So I, I love being on. I love being on that show. Do you know I love the fact about this show is that you and I get to show our talents tonight. We are two intelligent women who are actually get to talk about the issues, and people are actually listening. And I love this because I think they're, that men in the movement, they're very outspoken. They, they speak a lot, and that's fine. That's great. But I think it's, it's equally as important for the ladies to speak up and share their points of view from their standpoint Absolutely, and you know, there's definitely a lack of women in the libertarian um, and free-thinking, voluntarist, anarchist movement. So, you know, if there's a woman that has something to say, uh, I certainly do try to listen to what she says and see if I can certainly, um, you know, cer- uh, certainly align with it and agree with it for sure. Yeah, there certainly is a shortage. There's a lot of there's a lot of males who will speak up and. Like I said, now we I've got this show with John on Wednesdays, and now we have guest co-hosts like you, and we can help spread the message and get the word out from our point of view. And before Yay. we went to the break, we were talking to Larry, who, thank you for calling in, Larry, as always. Uh, you wanted to talk about Bitcoin, and I think you are far better knowledge in the subject of Bitcoin than I am. I'm still very much a novice in that, and I'm learning. Um, I do have to tell you that in the chat room powered by Bark from from uh, Freedomizer Radio, if you go in and create a name and you're active in the chat room, and there are a lot of people when they're in the chat room active, um, they'll randomly give you micro Bitcoins. So I have oh, a wallet. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I have a wallet. I think with all the... Uh, tally of the micro bitcoins that I own. I think I'm up to like 15 cents, <laughs> but I mean that's Bitcoin I didn't pay for, you know, and it all adds up. So it's it's kind of cool. Uh, 
It is kind of cool, and you know, not you know, and along with other cryptocurrencies, Dogecoin, which I'm sure you've heard of the Doge meme, correct? You know, that little Shiba Inu that has a very perplexed face with Comic Sans a conversation, and somewhere along the lines of you know, wow, so full, so meme, such Shib, wow. Do you do, are you aware of the Doge meme? Um, maybe not so much the meme, but I am familiar with the Dogecoin. I know that um, along with Bitcoin, there's Litecoin and, and Dogecoin, and they're kind of competing currencies. Yeah, so you know, there's you know, there is the rise of Dogecoin, and originally, um, you know, the Doge started as a meme from the Shiba Inu, and it's just, um, it's amazing just how much it's evolved. And there is Dogecoin, and you know, like you said, with the amount of uh, Bitcoin you have, you think you have about 15 cents. And the funny thing about Dogecoin is because you can get so much Dogecoin because it's so cheap. It's like um, I want to say like 4,000 Dogecoin for maybe like the equivalent of a U.S. dollar. So, you know, we'll see how how high Dogecoin gets up. I think right now um, Bitcoin is running along $600 per Bitcoin. Um, so we'll see if Dogecoin actually manages to, get, manages to catch up. But, you know, who knows for sure. Well, I did read an article talking about the two and comparing the two. It's like they they said um, that Dogecoin is the silver to Bitcoin gold is how they described it. And they said that they used to follow each other. They would rise in price together and they would fall together. Now they're saying that Bitcoin is back on the rise as far as how much it's worth and Dogecoin is at an all-time low. Yes, you are correct about that. Um, when I right before Pork Fest, um, I'm pulling up the Bitcoin. Um, what's it? Uh, what's it showing at right now? But right before I went to, um, or before I went to Pork Fest, Bitcoin was pretty low. It was like five fifty or five eighty. Now coming back from um, coming coming back from Pork Fest, uh, Bitcoin has now gone to about six hundred thirteen or so, based on a quick Google search. So, but I mean that's just the nature of the market. Bitcoin will rise and go, um, how however the market runs, and that's what's really neat about it is that it's decentralized. It's not backed by a Federal Reserve or anything like that. It's based on purely how much people are willing to pay for Bitcoin. And you mentioned uh, pork fest, and you mentioned Bitcoin. I know that a lot of businesses, a lot of vendors at uh, pork fest are accepting Bitcoin. Tell us about the atmosphere with Bitcoin in a place like Porkfest? Sure. I mean, uh, there, there is usually a Bitcoin Wi-Fi going around that people are able to access their wallets and purchase things with Bitcoin. Um, sometimes it was, uh, sometimes the network was very slow, uh, but typically I found that if people were patient and were willing to wait a few minutes, it would eventually go through. So that was really the only issue that we had with Bitcoin. Um, but vendors uh, would basically put up prices for however much they were selling their products, whether it was earrings or ice cream or whatever, uh, they would place how much it was, and then people, if they were choosing to pay with Bitcoin, um, could take the scanner on their phone, scan the QR code that, um, the, that the vendor, such as myself, would have in place, type in the amount, and just automatically send Bitcoin. You can send tips with Bitcoin. You can send tips with Dogecoin. Uh, it's very fast. Uh, it's very secure because when you have a wallet, you have a secure PIN, and also with that PIN, you have a uh, you have a password so it's very you know very secure uh, i know there was a controversy a few months ago with mount gox going bankrupt and i actually have a very good friend that unfortunately had um several hundred of his bitcoin stolen because someone had hacked into his mount gox database because it was not very secure so bitcoin has come a long way um especially with with blockchain blockchain's the wallet that i is in blockchain um, is by a lot of people the wallet of choice to store your Bitcoin in. Yeah, I have yet to get into this revolution. I really should. Uh, I know that with the use of Bitcoin, it is driving the government crazy. They're doing everything uh-huh. they can to in, invest and get their claws into it. And I read an article recently uh, that California Governor Jerry Brown has signed a Bitcoin legalization bill. Now, anybody who reads this would think, oh, that's, that's great. That's great because now Bitcoin is up and coming, but this is saying that this man has the power to do that. Nobody has the power to legalize Bitcoin. I mean, we've been using it even before they've been trying to legalize it. So this is, this is not a great thing. This is saying that by so-called legalizing it, that it was illegal to begin with. 
Well, that him finding that law just basically means that if someone's caught caught dealing with Bitcoin, they're not going to get in trouble for it. Uh, if you think about you know, the different kinds of drugs that are you know being legalized and everything, I mean, whether or not you legalize something, people are still going to find ways to obtain it and use it. So even if he were to ban Bitcoin and outlaw it, I mean, people would still find a way of using it. I mean, I mean, just look at the different kinds of uh, you know the Silk Road, for example, that you know they you know, operated a market that people were using Bitcoin. And, yes, the government is certainly trying to regulate Bitcoin, but we'll see how that goes. Well, I know also that recently the Fed sold off 30,000 Bitcoin um, that uh, they had confiscated from Silk Road purchases. And according to the article I read, one person bought every single piece of it or bid on every single piece, and they now own all 30,000. It's funny that you bring that up. I was just about to ready to mention that too. Um, uh, a side thing is that in order to even place, even in order to look at the Bitcoin and even place a bid, you had to show proof to the U.S. government somehow that you had two hundred thousand dollars in your wallet ready to purchase it if need be. So you were ha- going to have to send them some sort of wire transfer, and then you know, of course, hope after the government collects some interest on it that you would get your two hundred thousand back. See, this is just the little finite ways that they are trying to make sure that they have a hand in this process. They Uh are so furious right now at the fact that they have no control over the Bitcoin. Uh, It's the same thing with marijuana, and I'm bringing this up because I read an article recently that talked about how the government was going to um, pass a law that said – or that they had a patent on THC from the marijuana for the purpose of – you know, curing cancer or getting rid of cancer. And I'm sitting here thinking, how can you how can you sign bills to regulate that? You don't have the right to do that. You don't have that's not your business. So if they don't have their hands in every single thing in our lives, it drives them crazy. But most recently, and you brought this up, you were talking about Gary Johnson. Tell us about Gary Johnson. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Gary Johnson, as everyone knows, he was the uh, he was a libertarian presidential candidate a couple years ago. Uh, unfortunately, he did not win. Um, it was the largest voter turnout for a libertarian by any means, and he was one of the speakers at Porkfest last year. Um, a surprise for a lot of people uh, when Porkfest first ca- when Porkfest came around that year. Uh, last minute thing, hey, Gary Johnson's going to be here. It was definitely one of the more well attended uh, speeches for sure. But according to this article, which was posted by TheInquisitor.com, uh, he is going to be taking the chief executive role at a Nevada-based company that develops and supplies marijuana products for pot-friendly states like Washington and Colorado. So the uh, the, C, the company is called Cannabis um, Staffia, Inc., and it's in con- uh, conjunction with the company's merger with Kush, a pot firm that specializes in researching, developing, and licensing specialized marijuana products. So that's you know that's pretty exciting that. He, you know, someone, you know, a libertarian and someone who is very for the legalization of marijuana is taking on that kind of role in order to further that. That's very exciting. I think that Washington and Colorado have set the precedence, um, especially with social media, the internet. The reason the government wants to shut down internet so much is because the information is being disseminated at alarmingly fast rates. So when you have sources other than the national media, they can get out the information that nobody wants anybody else to know because it will be damaging to the agenda of the U.S. government. And I think because of social media and because of movements like ours and other people who might be on fringe movements, the word about what marijuana can do as far as healing and as far as providing relief to people who are terminally ill, the the benefits are amazing. So we have people like Gary Johnson who are helping progress these ideas and who are taking radical steps. I mean, that's that's a pretty radical step, wouldn't you agree? It's a it's fantastic, and I'm very excited to see um, what he can do with that. And uh, on the subject of pot, there uh, there was a recent article that was uh, distributed right here. Um, about six months after legalizing marijuana, um, two big things have happened in Colorado. And one of the big things is that their cash crop has turned out to be even more profitable than the state could have hoped. 
So in March alone, tax and legal recreation marijuana sales generated nearly $19 million, up from $14 million in February. They also um, gathered $10 million in taxes from retail sales in the first four months, money that will go to public schools and infrastructure. Uh, and also, the crime rates have suddenly fallen. Like the uh, marijuana-related re- arrests, I'm sorry, which make up for 50% of all drug-related crimes, have plummeted. So crime has gone down. Income has come in to help. You know, you know. And again, I don't necessarily, um, you know, I'm not an advocate for public schooling by any means. I don't think government should have any role in public schooling, and I'm for unschooling and homeschooling. But here are two incredible beneficial things that have happened to Colorado, all with the legalization of marijuana, which, you know, as we all know, doesn't really have any sort of harmful effects and is much less harmful than, say, alcohol, which is very legalized. Yeah, that that's always been one of the, the top things. You know, I know people who smoke pot. I don't think there's anything wrong with it personally. Um, so... I I think that this whole fight against legalization of marijuana is ridiculous, and I think they're going to keep fighting it until the government finds a way to regulate it once again. But the people I know who smoke pot, they always say, we don't feel like going out and doing anything. We just want to sit and veg. You know, so the argument concerning how alcohol is more lethal, it, it's fully understandable. The worst thing about smoking pot and being high is that you suddenly have a craving for the munchies. I have never been high. Um, this is one of the things that happened when I said pork fest where I committed, you know, you know, I, I did smoke um, a couple times of pot, something that is illegal in several states, but no one was hurt. I voluntarily took the, you know, had the obligation. The pot was not forced on me. I did want to try it out, and I found it to be a very, um, how should I say this, uh, it was, it was definitely a very gentle experience. Um, I did try smoking a friend's cigarette uh, several years ago, and I, got, I was completely disgusted because it was very painful in my lungs. I was coughing a lot. I thought to myself, how in the world can anyone develop any sort of addiction for cigarette smoke? And smoking, you know, smoking the pot, I did not get high. I only tried it a couple times, but it was very easy in lungs. I did not cough, and I'm thinking, you know what, I I can see, you know, how, why people do this because it's a very, it's a nice. It's a nice experience. It was in a very nice environment. I was with friends. Again, the marijuana was not forced on me. Um, it was being shared. Uh, I was in a very good group setting, and no, no one was hurt. Uh, no, you know, no victim, no crime. It was a, it was a great experience. So I, you know, again, I don't understand why people are so against it. Well, the reason they're against it is because the government tells them to be against it, because. Mm-hmm. If the government is against it, then it is going to deter people from using it. And then the government can keep their hold on the pharmaceutical market, making a racket, because we all know that when they prescribe pharmaceuticals, they cover and mask the symptoms, but they don't get to the root cause. Because then if they do that, there will be no need for repeat visits to the doctor over and over again. So they're going to lose their financial threshold and foothold if they legalize this stuff. So then if they legalize it and then they start regulating it, they can make sure that they have their fingers in every single market, especially in healthcare. You know, everyone, you know, people have gotten arrested for drunk driving, um, intoxicated. No one's been arrested for stone driving. In fact, if you're stoned and you're driving, you're going to be more aware um, of the situation, you're probably going to be even a much better driver, whereas you're not losing control of things like alcohol does. So, you know, again, pot's far le- far less damaging than alcohol is, and actually has healing abilities. So, it just it doesn't you know, it really does not make any sense. Well, like we said, it all comes down to government. It always comes down to government. So, um, we're going to take a moment right now. We're going to take a, another commercial break and we'll be back right after this i'm angie morelli and i'm with gmo free vegas so what are we going to do about this now well to begin with we advocate the labeling of genetically engineered food or foods with gmos Regardless of how you feel about the GMO issue, we can agree that we should at least have a choice of being informed about what we put into our bodies. We won't have a choice until these foods are properly labeled. We must remember who we are fighting in this battle. 
we are fighting corporations selling us poison backed by corporations making us poison. And these corporations will only respond to one kind of vote, the vote that we make with our dollars. Recently, Yoplait faced so much criticism over high fructose corn syrup that they removed it from all of their yogurts. Right before and after the march against Monsanto in May, we saw major corporations like Whole Foods, Target, and Chipotle make major announcements about deciding to label and or phase out GMOs. This is happening because of us, because we will solve this as making demands as consumers first. Starting right now, we're going to boycott corn. This is all you have to do, is don't buy corn. Corn on the cob, corn in a can, corn in a mix at a restaurant, any visible kernels of corn. All we are asking for people to do right now is to boycott corn. This is going to be a clear, completely simple message that will definitely get back to its makers. We won't stand for poison. We won't stand for cronyism. And that is why we march against Monsanto. Hi, this is Cindy Lake. Please listen to me on Freedom Talk with Cindy Lake at 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on freedomizerradio.com. All the issues that are important to you, like Common Core, Agenda 21, Free Informed Jury Association, Tenth Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Third Amendment, the Constitution. See you at freedomizerradio.com, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you there. And we are back. Hello, Danica. I am here. Awesome. And actually on the phone with us, too, I have Ken, the Liberty Phoenix, with us. As I understand, you all saw each other last week. Absolutely. Hello, Ken. Hey, Danica. How was the sales in that amazing agorist market? Oh man, I, I think about thirty percent of my uh, sales were in Bitcoin, so it, it was very. I find it very successful. That's awesome, dude. I, that's amazing. I came home with so much Bitcoin, I, I started giving it away to, to friends and family. Five bucks here, five bucks there. That's the only way to get into it, to get into it. Yeah, I get started into it. That's awesome. Uh, I had a couple people ask if I would accept Dogecoin. I'm like, well, you can tip me in Dogecoin, but you know, I'd prefer that you actually pay things in Bitcoin and. Uh, even silver, I took a couple of silver payments, so that was pretty fun. You know, I'm planning on uh, taking all of the copper that I collect for the next year and just bringing that to Porkfest and say, okay, if you want to pay in Dogecoin, can I pay in copper? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I will be there next year. I, I am vowing. I will be there next year. You, you better. better. I will. I missed. I missed seeing you this year, Danica. I was planning on going, but things just started falling apart, and I just took that as a sign as not this year. So I'm going to start planning yeah. now. I'm going to rely on myself. I'm going to stop relying on people I thought I could trust, and we're just we're going to do it. It's going to happen. We'll make it happen. No, I totally know where you're getting from with relying on people. I uh, had to rely on someone to move some of my stuff, and it turned out to be a near disaster at the end. Um, and thankfully, with the help of some friends, was able to avoid that. And next year, it's just like, no, I'm actually going to front the money for a trailer, and I'm going to try and get some of the money back by offering rides. Uh, so, no, I totally get from you with relying on people and having them just, you know, completely screw you over, intentionally or unintentionally. It really sucks. You know, that's, uh, that's the truly a wonderful and amazing thing about Porkfest is the agorism that goes on. Because if you can think of a way to make money, you can do it. Because it's all voluntary interactions. No one's forcing anyone's hand there. It's amazing. I love mm-hmm. it. It's so, so beautiful. Do you know what I love about this show tonight is that Danica ended up co-hosting for most of the show. Now we've got you on with us. And this is just like the voluntary uh, anarchist takeover. <laughs> <laughs> there's three of us. There's three of us on the line here. And John, who usually is my co-host, he is in the same mindset. So um, it's quite interesting. But I'm I'm absolutely loving this. This is fantastic. Yeah, no, it's anarchy show. rules all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this it's, is this is a good one. It's inevitability. Anarchy will always take over when you know people have a choice. 
just remember also, too, that this will be rebroadcast tomorrow from 4 to 6 Eastern on the Voluntary Virtues Network on YouTube. So you guys can tune in and listen if you want. Um, we need to get our numbers up, but this is, has been a great show. Danny is doing a great job. But uh, let's go back and talk about some of the topics we were talking about. Now that I have Ken on the line with us, I wanted to talk about the one article concerning the man who was not ticketed because he was filming the cop. Now, how much research did you do on that article, Ken? The one that was not ticketed because he was filming the cops? I thought that was the one that was uh, pulled over for honking his horn at the officer on the Illinois highway. Yes, that's the one. But didn't he, he didn't receive a ticket overall because the no. cop thought he was filming. Well, he, well <laughs> the officer, you know, he... He flies past this truck driver, um, doing well over the speed limit, and the uh, the truck driver is like, you know, you need to slow down. And you can see that he's the truck driver is um, some type of liberty activist. He's got a Guy Fox mask covering the headrest of his passenger seat in the video, which uh, you guys can find at fox4k.com. Uh, just search for truck driver pulled over for horn use, takes trooper to task for speeding in video. That's like the full name of it, so if you have a hard time finding it, it'll be there. Um, but you can see that the truck driver is definitely a, a liberty-minded individual, and this, this trooper, this Illinois State trooper, flies past him, going well over the speed limit. The trooper you know, tries to signal to him, you know, slow down using his horn, and uh, the, the trooper tries to threaten him with a ticket for improper use of horn. And I've pulled up the, oh the actual Illinois Vehicle Code, uh, sub- section 625, subsection 12-601, subsection A. And it, it, it covers horns and warning devices. Uh, if you'd like, if you don't mind, I'd like to read this, uh, this one part that actually applies to this. It states, every motor vehicle, when operated upon a highway, shall be equipped with a horn in good working order and capable of emitting sound audible under normal conditions from a distance of not less than 200 feet. But no horn or warning device shall emit an unreasonable, loud, or harsh sound or a whistle. Which, first off, okay, I own my vehicle. I can do whatever I want with it. If I want to play, uh, you know, the Mexican hat dance, I'm going to do that. (laughs) And it continues to say that the driver of a motor vehicle shall, when reasonably necessary to ensure safe operation, give audible warning with his horn, but shall not otherwise use such horn when upon a highway. Now, if, uh, if a cop is flying past me, not with his lights on, not chasing anybody down, not in, the, not in any emergency situation, I think it is who of, who of one to try and signal that to that individual to slow the heck down because he's putting people's lives in danger. And for that officer to come back, pull the man over and say, I'm going to give you a ticket for improper use of your horn and basically just threaten the man and try to, try to pull his authoritarian tactic, it's, it's, it's despicable. And these type of things need to stop. These officers need to realize that they are our servants. If we're going to live in a minarchist or a state of society, at least give us some dang leeway and actually do what you say you purport to do. Not come back here and, 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 and try to intimidate this man for doing the right thing. And the only reason that he didn't get a ticket was because he was filming. The cop comes back and says, oh, well, here, I'm going to do you a, I'm going to do you a little favor, and I'm going to write you this uh, this, this, this warning, uh, this, this vehicle inspection, and say that you've passed with flying colors, you know, you know basically like in an attempt to, to bribe the, the, the truck driver into not posting the video on Facebook. It's despicable. Oh, my God, oh, I heard that story, and it just made me want to just go, Arr! Well, the thing is, though, is that the reason I, I specifically wanted him to bring it up is that this happened in his home, in his home state where he is right now. So, um yep. I, I was there recently, and I can tell you we got into a discussion about carry laws in Illinois. Apparently, there are uh, inter – what, what do they call it? They call it interstate um, laws. Like they, oh, the interstate commerce clause? Uh, where they, well, they recognize carry license from other states. But right. Illinois, you have to live in the state to be able to do it. I know they passed it recently for open carry laws in everywhere except Chicago. But – you have to live in the state. You have to only only apply in that state. You can't. People from other states cannot apply to carry in the state of Illinois. You have to live there. So even though they're allowed to open carry, they won't recognize any other state's licenses. So my stepdad, who is, like I said, an open carrier, when he went to Illinois, 
he had to put his weapon away. He had to put it someplace that it was legal, legal for him to keep, like in his vehicle, because even though he was licensed in other states and in Georgia, he couldn't carry it in public because he wasn't an, a resident of the state oh, of Illinois. Could. He absolutely could. He has every ability to carry it. It's just if he would have, then authoritarian thugs would have tried to take it from him, and if, if he resisted, they would have put a bullet through his head. That's the only difference. Let's not mince words here. These people are criminals. Oh, yeah, there you go. That is the truth. That is the truth. And so he had to, he put it away. He didn't have to, but he put it away because he didn't want to get in trouble with the law. I mean, that's not, when we want to practice these things and when we want to be able to do what we need to do, it's not to cause a rift. It's not to kick up dirt. We just want to be individuals and we want to have those rights that we are supposed to be allowed to have. I'm not an anarchist in order to to stick my middle finger at the state. Not anymore, at least. I'm an anarchist because I believe I'm a free, independent human being. I govern myself. I don't need a piece of paper to tell me what's right and what's wrong. In fact, that almost never works. I am newly one, but, I mean, I'm learning, and I've got awesome role models like you two to help me out with that. But absolutely. I mean, just when I was done with politics, I was done with politics. There's nothing good out there anymore, and even Ron Paul said that the current political system is not going to work. It needs to collapse. It absolutely does, I, 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 and that's that's kind of you know the whole shtick behind my moniker of Liberty Phoenix, because I don't think that we will ever truly see freedom and liberty until the current paradigm falls and dies, and and we rise from the ashes like the true phoenixes that we all are. I absolutely can. It. Now, Ken, I did. I personally did have a question for you, if you don't mind asking. Um, I uh, I sometimes have to. I sometimes am curious between the difference between an actual voluntarist versus an anarchist. Now, voluntarism, you're volunteering. You, you're voluntarily making interactions with whoever um, you want and voluntarily doing things the way you want. Um, anarchy, to me, seems like it's the same thing because you know you're not governed by anyone. You're an individual. You're making decisions for yourself. But you know, again, you're you're voluntarily making choices or dealing with people. Um, can you? Are they kind of the same, or can you explain to me what what an actual difference between the two be? I don't see any true difference. I think it's just how individuals want to label themselves, um, and those labels okay. I personally detest. Um, I did see a <laughs> this awesome T-shirt while I was at Porkfest that I had to purchase. It was from a comic book strip called The Anarcho Voluntarist. And it has an upside down A, um, with, so that it has like the V inside the yellow circle. And I just, I, I absolutely adored it. I love the irony of it because it's basically the same word. It, it is basically the same word. Now, was was, was that being sold by uh, Davi Barker, or where was that being sold? I'm, I must have one myself. That was at the the tent, uh, the tent setup that was selling the shirts. That was like in the third, the third row of Agra Valley. Up toward the top of the hill. Um, oh, I don't recall okay. the name of the vendor, but they were like twelve dollars, and I actually uh, had I had sent him a copy of my my little my little effigy of my phoenix um, that I'm currently using for my Facebook profile picture or whatnot, and he put that mm-hmm. on the back of it. So I've got my anarcho voluntarist on the front, and I've got my phoenix on the back, and I love it. Right on. That is really, really cool. Um, I, speaking of Dolly Barker, I I also purchased several T-shirts myself. My favorite one that I got, um, it's kind of in that propaganda style, which is something I really love. It says, you know, um, who is Satoshi Nakamoto, who is supposedly the creator of Bitcoin, and it's got him with all the Bitcoin symbols in the back, and it's just it, it's just awesome. Like there was lots of good merchandise at Porkfest this year. I swear, Satoshi Nakamoto has to be an undercover CIA agent. It works too <laughs> well. It works too well. Um, yeah, Davi's, Davi's shirts were amazing. My sister convinced me to purchase the Kill the President t-shirt, the P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T, as not to be yeah. confused with any other homonyms or something that would sound similar. <laughs> and I, I absolutely adored it. I took my dog for a walk wearing it the other day, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out why everybody was staring at me so oddly. I know if something like that would make them turn heads, and then once they see, they'd be like, "Oh, oh, it's a, oh, it's a play on words." Smart. Let me ask you guys a question. Being in the same mindset here on this phone call, um, my usual co-host John, 
he, like I said, he thinks the same way that we do. But he also cannot stand the Constitution. He he literally dislikes the Constitution saying that no piece of paper should have control over his life. So believing the way that we do, how do you guys feel about the Constitution? Danica, you want to take it first? Uh, go Go right ahead. Well, the Constitution is nothing more than, as Lysander Spooner put it, um, it either gives us our freedoms or it allows them to be taken away. Either way, it's unfit to exist. Because anybody writing down on a piece of paper 150 years ago saying that there was this social contract and that the government's going to take care of us, I didn't have a say in that. I don't have any right to, to, to sign that social contract. It's a, it's a farce. It's an excuse for the Federalists to claim rights over it individuals that they don't have, plain and simple. I don't have the right to to peacefully assemble because a piece of paper says I do. I don't have the right to be free in my person's papers and effects because a piece of paper says so. I don't have the right to speak my mind because a piece of paper says so. I have those rights because I'm alive, self-aware, and cognizant. That's it. You would and John would have a great conversation. That's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much what he says. So I was just curious how that fits in. I know that um, Danica, the guy we had on earlier, Larry, for the past two weeks, every time he's called in, we've talked about anarchy. He gets so fired up. He gets so mad uh, <laughs> because he says, he says anarchy does not work. Anarchy will not work. Voluntarism will not work. He said that when the Constitution was originally created, it worked. And that the reason it fell apart is because we had too many people who got power hungry and they took over. And I told him, I was like, okay, well, you are welcome to your beliefs. But, I mean, he gets very upset. And he starts arguing with John. And usually I have to tell him, okay, that's the end of the conversation. So, you know, I've got people like Larry calling in and telling us that what we believe is is never going to work. You know, my roommate is almost exactly the same way. I, I, I espouse to him, we have amazing debates, and he listens to me and we speak intelligently to one another, but he just doesn't see how it could work, mainly because I think they're blinded by the paradigm that we're currently living in. You know, they, They've been brought up under this education system to believe that the state is God. You can't fight against the state. Nothing else is going to work. We've never tried true, free anarchy. We've never had a system of voluntary interactions before in the existence of humankind. It's either been forced by rock, forced by vote, or forced by gun. Thoughts yeah, you bring up a absolutely, uh, you bring up an absolutely great point, uh, Ken, uh, about by force or by gun or by a person, um, and also bringing up the whole biblical thing, which is what I was going to talk, which was what I was going to say about the Constitution is that at the time that it was uh, created. You know, it was obviously that we were a new nation trying to branch away from England and establish a different kind of democracy. Uh, like the Bible, I think that it had, it served its purpose at the time for a set of rules, but now it is archaic, it is outdated, it does not represent everyone in the United States, just like the Bible does not necessarily represent every single kind of Christian that's out there. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a very outdated, archaic uh, method of keeping people in line and that I also do not um, associate with it. I am an individual. I uh, will be, you know, I will govern myself. I will be personally responsible for my own actions, not my country, not my family, not my significant other, uh, none to that. Well, here's the other thing. With what we believe, what does it matter if this is what we believe? If we're not bothering anybody else, then what should it matter? I mean, we just want to take care of ourselves. Yes, we will reach out to our fellow man. People are like, well, what about the people who rely on the government for assistance? We are not opposed to to helping our neighbors. We're not opposed to giving back to the community. We just want to do it on on our terms. Absolutely. So many people think that libertarians and anarchists are just self-centered capitalists that refuse to help anyone else. And that is so far from the truth that it couldn't even be on the richer scale. I am, I go out of my way to help other people because it makes me feel good. It has nothing to do with um, making money for myself or any of that stuff. But it's a, it is a very selfish thing. I mean, there, I, per, I personally think that there's no such thing as um, as true. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, I can't think of the word right now, but. 
but there's no such thing as helping other people just for helping other people. You do it for for either uh, some type of uh, fame or or recognition or it, it just because it makes you feel good. And that alone, self uh, that self interest of because it makes you feel good, that's a selfish act, and that's not a bad thing. You are you're right. you are we're, correct about that. Oh, we're taught that selfish that selfish is bad, Danica. Oh, well, I was just going to say, you know, you are correct about that, that, um, you know, people have, certainly have selfish reasons for wanting to help out. You know, let's take moving, for example. No one likes to move, but you might help out, you know, your friend or your coworker move because you know that in the, in the, you know in the back of your head that if at one point you need to call on them for favors such as moving or any other kind of hard task, you might have a way of kind of holding it over their head or they might remember it and feel obliged to help you out because you took time out of your day um, and your schedule to help them out for that, and that you know, that, you know, while that may may be a selfish you know reason for for you um, for that you want to get something out of it in the future, you can feel good that you are willing to help out somebody. Selfish reasons or not, you're still getting a very complicated task done. Um, you know, if anyone thinks that libertarians are selfish and unwilling to help out, I mean, go look on Reddit, um, go look on Immigr, and you can see just these viral posts of these people saying this person lost everything, they're going uh, under all these treatments, they have no money, and watch the donations pour in. You know, these individuals are taking the steps to put something very, very horrible on a community such as Reddit and Immigr, and watching the donations pour in so that these people can get the care that they that they can get the money. Um, raised. So the, there's absolutely no argument that libertarians, um, and these people on Reddit or Immigrant are not necessarily libertarians, but the individual is not selfish. You know, pe- you know, people can crowdsource, people can come together for a common good. And, you know, the other thing is, too, is that if the government wasn't taking what they feel is their share to distribute to other people, if we had that money to give away, we might be more willing to donate and give to others. I mean, I don't think mm-hmm. in general – society as a whole, I don't think that we're evil, we're bad. I don't think that evil wins. I think that good wins if we have the resources and the means to be able to allow it to prosper. But when you're having automatically, you know, half your paycheck removed to to the government and letting the government do whatever they want to do with it, we're not so apt to be non-selfish because we don't have it. Yeah, I mean, you can't sit there and tell me that people are only going to give of their money because they get a tax break. Right? People give every single day for unselfish reasons or you know, because it makes them feel good without having to be forced by a gun to do it. If people had the money not stolen from their accounts, not stolen from their pockets, then they would be more apt to put themselves in a better position to be financially stable to where they might be able to give even more money to charity and help even more people. I do You're want to give a shout right out. To, I do want to give a shout out really quickly to the people in the chat room. We have a number of people who have joined us tonight and I want to thank them for joining us. Everybody can always join us and it looks like Bark, the people who run the chat room or own the chat room, whatever you want to call it, um, they uh, are starting up the Bitcoin lotteries again. You always get micro Bitcoins for um, the things that you say in the chat room, but they are also giving away more coins and lotteries in, in larger numbers. So I encourage people to come and earn some free Bitcoin. Why not? You know, that was one of my favorite parts about being a, a judge at the One Pot Cook-Off. Because bribery is totally legal. <laughs> was it really? Yes, I remember last year when I was a uh, judge at the One Pot Cook Off that I was offered uh, booze with uh, with the dish, and I was just kind of like, okay, well, you know, thankfully I do like the booze, so you certainly have my vote. <laughs> yeah, the same thing was going on this year. I, I I don't know how many shots of tequila I got. <laughs> oh, tequila. I- uh, I obviously missed out on a lot. It is certainly, certainly a goal of mine to be there next year. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to bring up this article that I came across. It actually was posted by the Campaign for Liberty, and I'm bringing this up because we keep talking a lot about New Hampshire. We keep tra- talking a lot about travel, and it apparently now the government, in the name of safety, is trying to regulate your GPS. Danica, did you use a GPS when you were headed out to New Hampshire? 
I did, and you know what? Let's let's you know stir the pot of controversy even by saying I used it on my phone, which a lot of states are now saying, "Oh, you can't use a GPS on a phone. That's unsafe." Derp a derp. And I'm like, well. I'm going to be taking my eyes off the road. You know, hopefully, you know, I'm already parked or something, but it's still a device that's not technically connected to my vehicle, but, you know, unless I have something connecting it. So, yeah, I there is a new law that just passed about how they're trying to ban ways and that GPS cannot be used from any sort of telephone device that has to be connected to the car already. And it's kind of like, all right, good luck with that one. Well, I know a number of people were talking about how they were using a GPS, Google Maps, and Waze. I know that a lot of people traveling up to New Hampshire from whatever state were talking about Waze. Now, isn't that the one where you can track your friends or watch their progress towards the state as well? Yes, you. Um, if you connect it. Yeah, if you connect it through uh, Facebook or anything else, uh, not only can you uh, connect your friends, but you can also, what's neat is that you can report, like, traffic accidents, you can report construction, and you can report cops, like uh, police traps. Yeah, and see, that's, and that's, they don't like that. Of course, they don't like that, because if you know where they are, then you can slow down and they can't pull you over. But here's the thing that kills me. They are saying that the regulations will start with GPS devices installed in the car, but eventually it will apply to smartphones, tablets. I mean, I use my phone GPS all the time, and but what I do is I hook it up to my stereo through the auxiliary input output, so I can listen to my music from my phone like a like to function as an iPod or an MP3 player. But then the lady is still talking. So if I'm listening to my music and she tells me to turn right off the freeway, I can hear her loud and clear. It's not distracting me. You know, so I think that's one of those little twists there that they're forgetting about. But it's saying that they're going to start targeting GPS, Google Maps, et cetera, so that people can print out the directions and read the papers while they're driving. <laughs> okay? So I'm sitting here reading this going, seriously? <laughs> You'd rather have them read maps while they're driving instead of keeping their eyes on the road and listening to their GPS speak to them. I mean, I call my GPS Frida because I I can't stand the name Frida and it's just fitting for my GPS. Sorry to any Fridas out there. It's just what I named her. But seriously, you're going to read a map or an atlas while you're in the driver's seat, but a GPS talking to you is illegal because it's in the name of safety. And it says, well, making it more... For the children, we have to make them safe. (laughs) Right? Get off my roads. So. <laughs> um, it says, number two is, will making it more, it says, what is it? Oh, these questions. You should ask yourself these questions, Congress, before they start this. Number one, is there an epi- epidemic of accidents caused by drivers distracted by GPS and Google Maps? Not that I know of. Next, number two. Number two, will making it more expensive and difficult for drivers to use these apps increase the use of paper maps, which may be more distracting and thus dangerous, than their electronic counterparts? Obviously. And number three, does Congress have the constitutional (laughs) power to regulate our apps? So the answers they put were no to number one. There's not an epidemic of accidents caused by GPS. Number two is yes. It will make it more dangerous. And number three, do they have the constitutional power to regulate? No, they don't. So they're now encouraging people to call their representatives and senators because this is ridiculous. This is as ridiculous as the legislator who tried to get start fining people in the state of Georgia to um, have a, a license plate put on their bicycles. You know, I've been listening to a lot of... Uh of a podcaster that's on the LRN network. I can't remember his last name. His first name is Mark, and he is all about the law and and taking taking every single case to court that you can, and mainly because he has a, uh, a, a motion to dismiss based upon the fact that no court in the country can claim jurisdiction because they don't have jurisdiction over you simply because you... Uh, exist within an arbitrary boundary, and the the three questions that they ask them to that they ask Congress to ask themselves, I think they kind of forgot one. They should Congress should ask themselves all the time: Do we own these people's bodies? Do we have a right to tell them what to do with their property and their lives? If they think the answer is yes, they need to quit their freaking jobs and dissolve themselves. If the answer is no, 
they need to not pass the law. Either way, they need to quit their jobs and dissolve themselves because they don't own us. They don't have the right to tell us what we can and cannot do in our vehicles while we are traveling on any road whatsoever. I don't care who built it, with whose money was stolen for it. Uh, these individuals in Congress do not have the authority to tell me what I can and cannot do with my rightfully owned property. And if they try to, that is injustice, and they need to stop, for Christ's sake, just stop. Stop trying to own people. I will say this. We have about nine minutes left in the show. I do have somebody who wants to speak, so I'm going to bring them in. Sure. Debt, Debt Shepherd, you are on the air. Hi, this is Greg calling from Nashville, Tennessee. Hello, how are you today? I'm good. Um, you guys are digging very deep. I, I like it. You're scratching the, the tip of the iceberg. And um, I was reading, you know, kind of the, the thing about vaccinations and, and rights. Thing. And I, I think the deeper thing that we need to really understand as human beings, let, let's just subtract U.S. citizens. Let's just subtract all of those words. They're all fake words. We're just human beings. We need to stop looking at government and asking them to make decisions before we can decide what it is that we want to do and be and think and feel. And, and you just ask the, the prime question, does Congress own your body? Now, we know the answer is no, but here's the problem. Most people in America continue to act and think and be and do as if Congress does own their body. And what they do is they stand around waiting for these electors to make decisions, which are not laws, and all a law is, it's a bunch of people that get together, and they say, there's a hundred of us, for example, and 52 of us have decided that this will be the way we will be, do, act, and, and behave, and we're going to take a piece of paper, some ink, and we're going to write that down, and then we're going to announce to the rest of the world that this is the new law, and Americans blindly go along with that, and they wake up and they wonder why they feel empty and cheated. And they wonder why they're jaded and overworked and pissed off and angry and violent and disconnected from the Creator. It's because we continue to wait for an elected group of people to make decisions, to write things on paper, and then tell us how we're going to be. And until we stop doing that, nothing's going to change in this country, whether it's vaccinations, money, law, or anything else. So to your listeners, I say this. If you're mad, you're actually sane, even though the system tells you you're not. If, if you feel something isn't right, you're normal. If you do nothing and stand by and blindly watch it continue, then you're actually buying into the insanity. So if you're upset and you're angry, I applaud you. Continue to do so and share it with your friends. You couldn't be more correct, sir. I've, for, I'd say, I want to say about the last month, month and a half, I have been telling and, and espousing the, the ideas of consent. You have to remove your consent from the state. That's the only way that it will ever end nonviolently. Because yeah. if we all simply stop silently giving them our consent to tell us what to do, stop paying your taxes, stop registering your vehicle, stop paying your traffic tickets, stop going to your court cases, it will show them for nothing more than the violent, brutish thugs that they are. And the the interesting thing of it is, and, and you made a comment earlier, sir, about jurisdiction. If one chooses to fight in that battleground, that's actually the key, is jurisdiction. And, and there's a way to win that. However, once you step into the courtroom, you're basically in the viper's den. You're basically in their, you're in their realm. And you must be very crafty, and you must be very skilled, and you must be incredibly knowledgeable. And even if you are all those things, there is no guarantee that the judge will even have any kind of a favor towards the way that you're thinking, because it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. You're, you're walking into a building, and everyone in the building, from the person who guards the building to the people who call themselves lawyers to the judges, to the bailiff. They all work for the same corporation. And you just have to understand that when you go to this place, you have been lied to and told that this is of the people, for the people, and by the people. 
That is an absolute lie. It is nothing more than a corporation. And when you go there, they are not on your side. They are there for one reason and one reason only, and that is to extract money from you. And if you don't know exactly what you're doing, don't, you shouldn't be there. You simply should not be you could, there. You couldn't be more correct. I mean, if you are going to try to challenge the state on any grounds in their court without some knowledgeable individual that has passed the, the British Association of, I can't remember what the bar stands for, but if, if you're not there with some representative that knows what they're talking about, you're going to lose because they're going to railroad you. And even if you do have an individual who knows what they're talking about, they don't, it, does, it, it, it may not matter because that judge, he may be up for re-election and he might have to say, you know what, whatever, I'm just going to, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, but I'm going to sign this little piece of paper and you're going to jail. And it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't really matter. You could say all the right things. You could have all the right precedents. You could have all the right case law in front of you laid out for, the, for that judge. And if he's a crooked individual, he's not going to care one little bit. He is going to set you up as a precedent to, to take down the next person, to, to put you as an example. Yeah, I mean, we have about three minutes left. Debt Shepard, thank you so much for calling in. I, I loved everything you had to say. Thank you for calling in. We're going well, to be wrapping that was up a great about piece by the minutes. two of you. That's awesome. That was wonderful. That's the kind of interaction that I love on the show. And I want to thank you two for being with me tonight. This was so much better than I could have imagined. It was so great having you guys. And we're not quite done yet. But I also want to tell everybody to please stay tuned and listen to the Proof Negative show, which is going to be coming up at uh, from 9 to 12. That's uh, our time, Eastern time. And, well, not our time. Danica's in my time, but uh, Lizzie Yay. is in, this, in Central, and um, Proof is over in Las Vegas, so that will be 6 to 9, his time, Pacific time. So stay tuned. Um, tomorrow we will have a rebroadcast on the Voluntary Virtues Network, which is a YouTube channel, and we hope you guys will listen. Also subscribe to that. There's tons of content. Adam Kokesh is on there, Walter Block, Michael Shanklin. Uh, who else is on there? Oh, there's just a, a multitude of people. Um, Stephen Mol- Yes. Stephen Molyneux is on there. You guys should all listen to that. It's it's marvelous. It's a liberty person's dream come true, quite honestly. Thank you, Michael Shanklin, for putting that together. Um, we hope that you will join us again next week also for the PM show once again on Wednesday night here on Freedomizer from 7 to 9 Eastern. Um, we have maybe just a few more seconds. Guys, do you have any last thoughts? Welcome to Porkfest on the Internet. <laughs> there you go. That's a great one, Danica. No victim, no crime. Amen. No victim, no crime. Guys, so fantastic to have you both. You're both welcome back anytime. I have much love for the both of you, as you guys know that. So you are always welcome guests with me. I hope that uh, John will listen to the show and enjoy what he has to listen to, because it was by far one of the best episodes we've done, I'm sure. So hope he enjoys it. He will be back with us next week. I'm going to end the show now with the music, There is Love. It's by our friend Harrison Ray. And uh, he's always welcome on our show as well. So thanks for listening. You guys enjoy and have a great night. All right. Thanks, Ken. 